Okay, so here's how this is going to roll tonight. I actually gave you a handout that said how many minutes I'd be in each section. That's for me, but I didn't take it out of yours. Um, so we'll go through some lesson development helps. That's the first section. Then we'll go through some storytelling thoughts and helps. Then we will finish with some classroom procedure stuff. Okay? So lesson development. Um, we got here in part because I guess we're going to a new curriculum for Children's Church. Is that for the whole Children's Church all the way across the board or just the preschool? Yeah, okay. And it's he has spoken by his son, correct? Yes. Yeah. So if you were to take a look at the he has spoken by his son handouts, yes. It's Old Testament. Oh, okay. So you're doing the series, the 252-week series. Yes. Okay. So he has spoken by his son as New Testament. He established a testimony as Old Testament. But if you were to look at the curriculum, and if you're used to something that's robust, like it lays out the story for you, it tells you stomp three times right here and spin in a circle to be the whirlwind of Elijah. If it does all of that for you, this does not. So if you're looking for something different and you see this, you might go into, <laughs> in particular, if you start to prepare on Saturday night at 10 o'clock. So we're going to talk about developing a lesson a little bit. And I've prepared at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. I know about that. But... Um, Hopefully, we'll share some things that are helpful for putting together a lesson where you don't need all of that stuff. The good stuff's there, but it's going to require some work. So we've got a couple of principles here in these notes. Number one is this. Don't overlook a key principle when you're teaching children. You must be growing yourself. You have to be growing yourself. I have this, and I'll just follow through my notes. A good teacher ministers the word from the overflow of a full life. Now, what does that mean? It means that you must live according to the following principles as a servant in the church to children. So here's some principles. Number one, the most effective teachers know God through his word. You need to be in the word. So teaching kids isn't a matter of you jumping into a curriculum, figuring out their three high points, the big theme, the craft, and then rolling with it. That's nice. But you need to be in the Word yourself. Communicating biblical principles or truths doesn't come out of a vacuum. So you just don't suck it out of your thumb. If that's your approach, after a period of weeks, you will begin to say the same thing. It might be in slightly different ways, but it will be the same thing. And as a teacher, what you don't have is absolutely impossible to impart. My son can play guitar, and he plays it pretty well. In fact, he plays it so well, and he's, he's a halfway decent-looking guy, and he sings pretty good. And I think, man, I really would have liked to have been able to do that when I was 30. I could sing to my wife. I could sing to people. I could lead worship. You know why I can't do that? Because I never practiced guitar. So if I pick it up, I can strum a couple of things, but there's absolutely no freedom at all. There's no ability to do it. He can pick it up, listen to something, and start plucking away. My wife can do the same thing with piano, can hear it and begin to play. Um, they are able to share what's in them, in part because they practice. And the same thing is true with the Word of God. Most effect, or The most effective teachers are those upon which God works. Just look real quick if you have your Bible. If you don't, I'll read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And then we see a similar idea in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. But for the sake of time, we'll just stay here. In verse 24, it says this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. So 
right there, those three verses, he's saying this. In athletics, the one that practices and the one that competes is the one that's rewarded. Now look what he says in verse 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, what's the point that I've been making? You cannot minister to people from the Word of God out of a vacuum. If you're not studying yourself and God is not working on you, you're not a vessel available for his use to be used as he wants and as he desires. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. I discipline my body. He's a guy in the word. He's a guy listening to the word. He knows what the spirit wants him to do. And he brings himself into line with what God's teaching him. Why? So that he does not preach to others and then become disqualified. You need to be growing. Teaching children is not just about showing up on Sunday morning or on Sunday night. That's important. Showing up's important. In fact, it's a very big part of ministry. But you need to be preparing during the week. Now, I said you must minister out of the overflow of full life. Here's what it means to be full. I've already mentioned this. Maintain a consistent lesson study time. So, I think the best way to teach children, if you're working with a curriculum, is pick that up on Monday and start working through it. Just read it. Get familiar with it. Work on it during the week. Maintain your own personal Bible study time so that you're being filled. Pray for each of your students during the week by name. The classes here are getting bigger, praise the Lord, but I don't believe we have a class that numbers 80 or 90. You might have a class of six or seven, maybe eight or nine. It's manageable to pray for them every day. Mention them by name. You can ask parents special needs that the kids may have and bring that before the Lord. Pray for yourself in the leading of the Spirit. And then establish some patterns in your life that nurture improvement as a teacher. Have you ever invited somebody to give you input on your teaching, your classroom management? Have you ever done that? That is part of nurturing or teaching out of the overflow of a full life. Ask for input. Ask somebody to come sit in. Ask a parent. How do you think it went? Where can I improve? And then invest in your ministry. Buy some books about teaching children. Go to some articles online. They're all over the place. And read about teaching children. And try and implement some of those things that you learn. So that's a key principle. You must be growing yourself. But then we get to this principle. Don't ignore a fundamental fact. Lesson development is work. It's just work. It's not easy. Um, I mentioned that uh, the material in terms of what is typically laid out in a curriculum, this isn't that kind of robust thing. For example, if you bought group curriculum, you open up the box, you've got the bells, the whistles, and all the things that go along with all the little visual aids that you're supposed to use. They're all there. So if you're supposed to ring a bell for the priest that goes into the temple on the day of, or the, tab or the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, you've got the bell. You probably got a robe with um, little frillies on it. You might even have somebody that uh, made a tape that you can hit that sings in Hebrew. Group curriculums like that. I mean, it just, <laughs> we back a truck up and drop it off. Other curriculums, not quite like that. And the Desiring God or the True 78 stuff is not. So we're here to talk about lesson development. A good curriculum will lessen the preparation time required of a teacher. Teaching materials will help you with things. The provided aims or aids will make your prep time shorter. You might have craft ideas. But this curriculum pushes teachers to do the hard work of lesson development, and I think that's as it should be. We want you investing the bulk of your time working to understand the Bible story to tell the Bible story. That's what we want you to do. Now, what do I mean by understanding the Bible story? We don't mean know it so well that you can retell it accurately, though that's important. It is important to tell it accurately. But what we mean 
is helping children grow in their familiarity with the stories, poems, commands, and propositional truths so that God ministers to them. So, and depending on the age group, the goals change a little bit. But let's say we're talking about fifth graders and you're going over the arc. We, we aren't really aiming at a child going home and saying they needed seven of these animals and pairs of these kind. And they were able to draw them all out. That's not unimportant. But the bigger deal about the story of Noah and his ark is that God saved sinners. He made a way for sinners to be rescued. He made a way for his creation to be preserved. That's the big thing there. That's what we want them to know. So when they're in the car going home and mom or dad asks, what did you learn today? God, in spite of the fact that we are sinful, did all that is necessary for us to be rescued from our sin. We deserve punishment, and he chose not to punish us. We saw that in the ark, and the teacher then told us that that's what Jesus did. Boom! That was a successful class. Well, Johnny, were there seven lambs or just two? I don't know. Well, we'll look that up later, maybe. But they got the big idea. They got the big idea. Were the elephants babies, or were they full grown? Well, I don't know. How long was the ark? I don't know. That's not unimportant stuff. But if that's all they get and they miss the thing I just talked about, they've missed the thing that's most important because that's what ministers to their soul. If they take home a set of factoids, does that impress their heart? Does that push them through the work of the Spirit to become a Christian? No, nah, not really. Not really. Maybe a veterinarian. But... <laughs> We don't want to use Bible stories to push them to be veterinarians. Other things can do that. Let's say we were going to tell the story of the ugly duckling. Okay, you've all heard that story, right? Great story. What would you want a child to remember from that story about your effort or through your effort? What do you want them to take from that story? The story of the ugly duckling. Ooh. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, because the outsides might might not be what they actually are. Yeah. Well, there are all kinds of weird things that can be done with that. But what happens in the Ugly Duckling story? A transformation. Everybody thinks that the little, or the, I, I don't know, I can't, it's boy, boy, duck, girl, duck, when they're ugly. You know, I don't know what it, I don't remember. What's the little creature turn into? A swan. The, that little creature was a swan the whole time on the inside. You didn't see it till later. That's when it was revealed. The, the, the story pushes on us to know people what they're really like on the inside. Don't make judgments based on what you see. Make judgments based on what you discover. We need to be pressed into that with that story. That's what you want a child to remember. Um, all of these other things are very good, and they're a part of that. That's the kind of thing. But if they can just retell it and they don't get the moral, then we failed. We fail. Now, Truth78 on their website put together some things to help people develop lessons from the material. So they'll give a passage of scripture, and then they give you some steps that you can take in order to go about figuring out what the Bible story actually means. And here are the steps. There's five of them. They say, number one, so this is on page two of your notes, Summarize the content. Do you have that on your notes? Okay. Then you need to grab your homiletic sheet. I have it on mine. So it's this piece of paper right here. This is printed right from their site. It says homiletics at the top. And the reason they put the word homiletics 
is the goal of following a procedure like this is to understand the story and to put it into a format that you can share. Okay? So, you can follow along here. Number one is content. They want you to list the different events, topics, or conversations in the passage. So let's say, in fact, we're actually going to do this. Go to Acts chapter number 5 if you have your Bible. This is the section we're going to just practice with. Acts chapter number 5, verses 1 through 11. Um, Elizabeth, you have your Bible. Would you read verses 1 through 6? Do you mind? And Brian, do you mind reading 7 through 11? All right, go ahead. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Thank you. Okay, so this is the text we're going to play around with tonight for a few minutes. So here are the steps. This is how um, True 78 encourages their children's teachers to work through a text. And this is similar to what is taught at teacher training for adults. Similar. So number one, you work through content. They say list the different events, topics, or conversations in the passage. And they say this in their bullet points. Keep the list brief in length. In other words, don't list everything out. A dirt particle fell from the heavens. The sun rose in the eastern sky at an angle of 38 degrees. They, they just get the, the bullet list so you have an idea on what's going on. Keep the list brief in expression so your items are two to eight words in length, not paragraph descriptions. You're not writing a new story. You're trying to summarize the story that you're studying. Each item may include one to several verses, so you list the verses out next to it. That's what they say last. Write the verses beside each item. Um, and we'll get to this in just a second, working through it. Then number two, divisions. Divide the content list into main events or topics. These are called divisions. In a story, the way they've structured them for the curriculum, there will usually be between two to four divisions. So you're not dealing with the whole book of Isaiah. You're dealing with smaller chunks. Write a complete sentence as a heading for each division and include verses. And follow the same sequence of the passage. So the way the passage unfolds, your sentence should unfold. Then you have a subject sentence. Now they want you to take your divisions and summarize all of them into a one word or one ten word or less sentence. It should describe the content in a crystallized form, include an idea from each division sentence, focus on content, not lesson at this point. It must be a complete sentence that contains a subject and verb, and include what makes this passage different from others in the Bible, and be no more than 10 words. Now, you look at this and you think, man, alive, this is a police state. One, no one's going to check you. you. When you walk to teach Sunday school, you don't have to turn the sheet in. But why are they driving you at listing these things, putting divisions, and then writing summary sentences? Why do they want you to do that? So you know what you're focusing on when you get to the lesson instead of trying to read it and forgetting what you're focusing on. 
right. So the story has a point. It has a focus. That's to be your focus when you teach the kids. A lot of people teach children with the idea that all we're doing is disseminating information. That's not what you're doing. You are giving them information, but you have a prophetic function in teaching children. You are to speak to them, and God is wanting to use you to speak to their heart and mind. And the way that you do that is you press upon them the moral ought of the text. You press that to them, but you have to know it. You have to know it. And this is a process by which you can come to understand that. So one, two, and three are getting to the point or getting you to the point where you understand what the point is of the story. Then you look at number four. This is where you really work out that moral ought and where you're going with the story. So the aim is the main lesson you want the audience to learn or to act on. Aim should coordinate with the subject sentence. Ask yourself, what does God want us to know about himself and therefore live by? You see that? So what is this passage pushing me to do? What is it calling me to do? Look for the main message. The plain thing is often the main thing. The wording for your aim begins. Cause the audience to what? Learn this or cause the audience to do this. And again, this is strange when you're teaching kids. People don't think this way. But they're moral beings. And the older they are, the more responsible and culpable are they are for their own behavior and response to God the Spirit. So we have to press this upon them. And then you can see the application point. Okay? And I, I don't need to go into that right now, but I want you to grab now this piece of paper. Okay? It says demonstration. I want you to work at each of your tables through this. So you're working on Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. If you want, you can read the little section before, which talks about the church sharing with one another. Um, but I just want you to work through, write down a list of things that happen in the text. If you've got Jeff at your table, or Pierre at your table, or Joel and Matt at your table, You've got teacher training guys right there. You might want to borrow one of them. But, um, and then you work on divisions. And then you try and put together a subject sentence. And there are all kinds of things we could do with this text. I just want you to work through it for, it is right now, 7.35. You have till 7.42. <laughs> okay, now, those, that, that conversation about fear is really important. But I can't, I can't, what I'm doing tonight, I can't do all that. Um, so, you've got some divisions. You see how you have to go through that exercise. What might you do in terms of a truth that you're going to communicate? Before we do that, what's the danger that the kids take away from this story if you're not careful? They, well, I, 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 I don't think that's something I'm worried about. I'm really not. What did they do? What did, what did the, the couple get rid of? Oh, property. property. So what are the kids, what will they misconceive if you don't carefully lay the story out? Was it wrong for them to keep profit? No. They lied about it. Why did they lie about keeping the prophet? They wanted to look better than what they did. Yeah, they wanted to look like everybody else that did it. That's chapter 4. Well, they wanted to look better than they actually were. And again, there's nothing wrong with keeping the prophet. But they wanted to present themselves in a way that looked like perhaps this group. And if you're not careful, the kids will walk away and they'll fall into democratic socialism very fast, and we don't want that. That's another story, sorry. Um, so what would be the main point that you're trying to get across? You could do that, sure. Is that the main idea? Lying is a sin. It comes out in the text, for sure. We shouldn't live to impress others. We should live in truth before God. 
That's one thing, at least right now, I try and impress on the kids. It's very tempting to try and live to impress other people, but there's only one that we really and truly live before, and that's God. Now, there's some really good stuff in the context of the church being developed here. What do we see in a church? Chapter 4, a church cares for one another. The people in the church care for one another and will even give of their stuff to help others. So Ananias and Sapphira should have felt secure in this church and before God that we can keep back some stuff for our own needs and share what we're only able to give. No one said you had to give away everything. Yeah. So being that said in chapter 4, we need to lay a little bit of groundwork. Yeah, you could. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things to do, but this just shows you the exercise you need to go through. Now, there's another little handout here. Okay, This is for kids. This yeah, is Brian. a tool that teachers use for helping kids retell a story. So children understand a story when they can retell it. So here's how it works. There's the setting. You have characters. Then you have the problem. What's the problem in this text? Sin, lying, they kept back. Um, are they going to get away with it? Is the church going to stand for holiness? Their God is holy. Are they going to be holy? So we don't know until we see Peter confront, and then we see how serious God is, or how seriously God takes sin. And he kills Ananias and his wife. So the problem is sin. What is the church going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And then you have the beginning of the story, the middle of the story, the end of the story, and then you have the solution. So what's the solution at the end of this story? How is it resolved? They die. Yeah, it's not good. Yes, that's the good part. So God worked. He addressed evil. And then there was fear in the church. And we see that word fear throughout Acts a lot. When God's working, there's fear. And when God is uh, respected and awed, then society, the church in particular, flourishes, but society in general benefits as well. So you could use something like this, too, to work through on your own. It's simple, but you could. And then you could have the kids, if you had time, work through it as well and write it out. And then they could go home and tell the story. So that's that. It, and it, de well, it depends on the age group that you're teaching. So, right. So you have to keep it simpler. When I teach children, I, I write my lessons the same way. I start the same way that when I start with adults. Um, because that's, if I'm going to do the study, then I might as well prepare myself to teach the oldest group, and I can always dial it back. But if I write it like I'm going to teach three-year-olds, then it's going to be very difficult to ramp it up. So I would start with this truth in my notes that I mentioned. And again, I don't know if this is it, but we shouldn't live to impress others. We should live in truth before God. Okay, That's the, that's the thing that I'm working with. And then I begin to think about the lesson. How am I going to present this to kids? Am I going to use a song? What kind of activity am I going to use? How am I going to reinforce this? How is classroom movement going to work in this 40-minute session? Because I'm not going to lecture the whole time. Um, I begin to frame it out that way. And when I teach or preach to kids, I preach the same way that I preach to you on a Sunday. It's just at a lower level. Outlines, truth. Set up homiletically? Yes. I would, uh, well, again, I'm answering off the top of my head, but um, I might tell them a story from my own life. I mean, I, okay, I can think of one. I was probably fifth grade. My dad had a Lionel train that he inherited from his grandfather. So this train's old, and it's a big one. It's really nice, and he kept it up in a shelf. Okay, we had a built-in at this house on 161 North Mill Street. He was at work. It was summertime. I opened the three drawers underneath, climbed up, grabbed the train, and pulled it out and played with it. But not on the electrical track. On the carpet. 
Okay. But when I was done playing and I turned it over and I saw the carpet fibers in it, I felt fear because I knew my dad was going to come home. Now I did the uh, cover up. <laughs> I climbed up, put it up there. It took a couple of days, but he found it. Now the fear wore off until I heard Clifford Dale, and I knew what that meant. And I came, and the belt came off, and I got it. So fear is, I feared my dad's position and my debt to him. I did my dad wrong. Now, the fear here is a little bit different than that, but I'd think about it a while so that I could explain it so that they might understand it. Um, in well, kindergarten, great, your dad loves you. he does. Thank you to point out, you know, he still loved me and all those things, but I it was tested. Yeah. When you do wrong, you should expect to be punished. Yeah, the, the, the thing, that's true, but the fear here is a healthy one. They feared, yeah, yeah, it was a motivation to do right. So I'd have to think about that, but I, I tell stories are important ways to communicate to children, which gets us to the next section, okay? Um, I got to fly. So storytelling helps and thoughts are thoughts and helps. This fits in with what we were just saying. So there's a couple of quotes here. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the things we need most in the world. Now, these are anecdotal in that they're not coming from Scripture. These are not quotes from Scripture. They're observations from people. So Philip Pullman said, stories are the things we need most in the world. Now, we know theologically the thing we need most in the world is a Savior. But how is, this, how is the work of Jesus told to us? Story. Story. The, the whole scripture is a story. Look at the next quote. Pamela Rutledge wrote a lot of stuff about story. This is just one thing. Our brains respond to content by looking for the story to make sense out of the experience. No matter what the technology, the meaning starts in the brain. If you went to, let's say we all went to a magic show, and we thought we were going to see a bunch of magic, and it's not real impressive, but then out came a really good storyteller, man or woman. Every single one of us would be caught up in what was happening. We're adults, but we still like stories. That's why we watch movies or read books. We like stories. A 99U internet article by a gal named Jen Godbout. She was writing about the five beats of successful storytelling, which is really operates in the business world, and it's how people interact with one another to get jobs and stuff. You know, you tell your story. But she wrote this. We know that we can activate our brains better if we listen to stories, but why is that? The simple answer is we are wired that way. A story, if broken down to its simplest form, is a connection of cause and effect, and that is exactly how we think. We think in narratives all day long, no matter what it is we are doing. We think in stories. Go back to the garden. What did God tell Adam and Eve they could do and they could not do? He said you can eat of everything in the garden except from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that you eat of it, you will die. He told them something of cause and effect. Now afterward, they could tell the sad story of what happened. But God, through proposition, was preparing them for it. There's this story of beauty and glory and wonder, and you can discover it if you stay away from that tree. If you don't, another story is going to be written. We think in story. Um, Yuri Hassan, a researcher at Princeton, said this, Story is the only way to activate parts in the brain so that a listener turns the story into their own idea and experience. That they've actually studied the brain of human beings when stories are being told and watch how people react. 
And certain parts of the brain go boom. They just go live when stories are told because people identify with them. Um, so in terms of reinforcement then, so storytelling is powerful. That's the first point here. And then there's this, this idea of reinforcement. Retelling a story requires advanced work and a free spirit. We've already talked about that a little bit with what we were just doing. I've got that Esther lesson, and I want you to take a look at that now. This is actually missing a key component that we were talking about tonight, which is moral ought. This is the first lesson that I was teaching a group of kids in a program called The Race at Berean. We went through the book of Esther in 2012. I taught all the kids groups and adults, I think men and women. I don't, I don't remember. I don't know what they were doing. Okay. So I had the responsibility to teach Esther. The first section of text was Esther 1, 1 through chapter 2, verse 23. And I saw the lesson theme. What I wanted to teach them was providence. And providence is this idea. And by the end, they could quote this. Not that night, but we went over it every week. God's control of everything, everywhere, all the time so that his plan happens. When we got done with Esther, I wanted them to know that. Providence is God's control of everything, everywhere, all the time so that his plan happens. So how did I start that night? And this is, I'm getting to story. I put the word providence on the board. And because I had different age groups of kids, when I was in the little group, I asked them to identify all the letters because they can't read yet. What letter is that? 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 And they said all the letters. Then this is what that word is. It's providence. I want you to say providence. They said providence. And we went over that again. And then I gave them this definition. And we repeated it back and forth. And then I showed them a video, which was pretty cool. Because you could, it was a marionette who was a magician. The, ma the puppet was the magician. Actually pulling things out of a hat and stuff, which is pretty cool for a marionette. And made a ball balance. But anyway, you could also see the puppeteer. He had black pants on, but you could see him walk the little magician out. So the kids could see the strings slightly. They could see the puppet, but they could also see the puppeteer. And at the end, all I was going to do was ask them some questions about what the puppeteer was doing. What did you see happen? Well, somebody was controlling the puppet, making the puppet do what he wanted the puppet to do. And I said, that's kind of like Providence. You couldn't see the man's face. You saw a man there. We can't see God, but we see what God's doing all around us. And that's providence. Just trying to get them to understand it. If you flip over to page number two, with the older kids, I gave them some of these background facts. God made a big promise to Abraham. God sent Jesus as a seed of Abraham. The events in Esther take place between the time of Abraham and Jesus. I wanted them to understand that, and I went through that real fast. Then here's where I emphasized God's providence through the king. So you can see on page three, the outline points. The king of Persia shows a proud face. So everything was about the king's face. The king of Persia shows a proud face. The king of Persia shows an angry face. The king of Persia shows a sad face. That's page four. The king of Persia shows a happy face. And then lastly, he shows a relieved face. And all of those things, and I had little pictures on my PowerPoint. Angry, sad, happy, relieved. That was a hard one to find. But took them through the story of King Ahasuerus, and then at the end told them that God was in control of all this because something incredible is going to happen through this king and to this king by God's hand, by God's providence. And then we went through providence again. Um, again, the, the missing component in this would have been a sense of moral law. I did not do that that night. That's bad, bad, wiki, bad, bad looking at the lesson and evaluating that could change. That's just an example, though. Um, outlining it in a way that they could remember and telling the story. So I didn't lecture. I didn't, here we have a sad face, and let me tell you about that. We didn't go into that. I told the story, but gave them outline points to follow in it. 
and then gave them, this is what God's going to do. Um, in terms of telling a story, if you know it, you know the components of it, you can tell it to the kids. Don't read it to them. Um, if you have a book assigned, you know, the Jesus storybook of the Bible, and you're supposed to read that, that's different. But, but know it so well that you can keep eye contact with them. But it's best when you're in story mode, you're walking around, you're telling them the story. You walk up to a little boy or a little girl, and you look at them, you stop. If you stop talking, they'll all look at you. And then you can clap your hands, and you can jump into something, and they follow you. They're right with you. Keep them going. And don't tell it forever. You know, get to it, get it done, and get your point out. But storytelling is powerful. So if you will take this, this, this little tool, outline this story, get that main point, and then put your lesson plan together, you'll be able to powerfully communicate to kids. Little ones, two- and three-year-olds, and fifth graders. Um, yes, Pierre. When it comes to, um, you know, the storytelling, so if you know your theme, your main theme, your main idea, what you're getting at, you hit high points on the story that are necessary details for them to tell so that when you get to the end, your reinforcement of the theme is not a surprise to them. They will anticipate it. Even in their little, little two- and three-year-old brains, they'll anticipate it. It won't be a surprise like, eh. They'll get it to some degree. So you have to get the facts in from the story that carry the theme. The other stuff can lay off to the side. So I didn't go into all that stuff with Esther. I told the main stuff to get across the idea that this king was the man that God had his hand on. And all of these emotions that he experienced led to somebody being dismissed from the royal house so that somebody could come into the royal house. A queen he didn't like is gone, and he's going to find a queen that he does like. And then you leave it at that. Well, yes. let's go back to um, the theme and the moral ought. So the moral ought, the aim that you're, you're taking with the text is really how you conclude it. So let's go back to Acts chapter 5. If we're saying that um, lying is sin, God sees our sin, and he will deal with it. Let's just roll with that for a minute. Then we might say, if you've lied and no one knows about it, know that God does. And a way to handle that is to go tell the person that you lied to that you did. Um, if you haven't lied, then praise the Lord for that. He's very kind to you and purpose to tell the truth before him and know that he'll give you power to do that. And again, I'm just spitballing, but you wrap it up that way. And then the next week, you pick up the next story, and you have that moral law, and that's how you end that, that session. Yeah, and if there are handouts, parent take-homes, those could probably, I don't, do we scan and, can we scan and send those to, to parents? We just have to figure out a way to do it. But that's good. That's a good question. It is, and yeah. again, it's, it's very cursory what I've done, but how to put together a plan for teaching a Bible story um, and that's very, very important. That's foundational what you're doing. But the classroom setting is very important, too, in particular when you teach kids. So just some guidelines. Number one, in terms of being intentional, be intentional about showing your students love. So I have four bullet points here. Greet the children individually at the beginning of each class. Now, this necessitates that you're actually there before they are. <laughs> This is so important. It should not be the case unless you are providentially hindered that that kid gets to that classroom before you're there if you're responsible for teaching them that day. They should not get there before you. The only exception might be if their parents brought them, let's say, for a children's church and they took them right back there and did not come in to sing. Well, you're kind of caught then. What are you going to do? Or... On a Sunday school time, you're teaching Sunday school, and they happen to come early. They wanted their children to see the church at 6 a.m. Okay, we'll give you some slack on that one. You didn't beat them that day. Well, I don't understand what you're saying. 
Oh, yeah, that's different. I'm talking more about kids that, um, well, the children's church would be, they, they're dismissed from the auditorium. But Sunday school, I'm thinking about primarily, be there before them so you can greet them, so you can greet your parents, so they see you. Number two, know the children and their families. When I, um, at, at the previous three churches that I was at, I think it was three, um, I would know kids' names before I knew adults' names. It just was easier for me to remember kids. And if you knew them, and you knew a little bit about them, that was a big deal. And it means something to mom and dad, too. So take the time to know their name, and I'm sure that's the case here that we do, but know something about them, too. Ask a question about something that they commented on the week before. Maybe they played a baseball game. Maybe they were in a dance class. Maybe they had a field trip at school. Ask about it. Then demonstrate courtesy, kindness, friendliness, humor. That goes without saying. And then make each one feel comfortable, even the new ones. So if a new kid is in, introduce them to the other children. Talk about the room. Tell them where things are. Tell them where the bathroom's at so that they know that they're welcome. It's a safe place. Here's another one. This, this is where I'm a little neurotic. Um, create an organized, comfortable, and purposeful learning environment. What should parents and children see when they walk into a classroom? Nothing you will not be using that day. Now, that's a double negative. It, they shouldn't see anything that is not going to be used that day. So, in your classroom, a chair should not be on the floor. The curriculum from the week before shouldn't be on the table. All that stuff should be put away. What should they see? Only the stuff you're using that day. Now, why? Why am I like that? Why do I believe that? One, because I'm a nutcase. Two, it's distracting. You're, if you're a kid, there's enough that gets your attention. You don't need more. Make it look neat. Make it look purposeful. Parents should see that. That'll comfort parents and it'll help kids. Then we get to the second bullet. What should parents and children anticipate from you? They should anticipate that you will be a teacher that is friendly but not a chum to students. Now, you might watch me around kids and think, yeah, right. You just walked over to that little guy and... Mm -hmm. That's true. I'm like that with kids. But I, I also call a spade a spade. And if little Billy's messing around, Billy, we don't act like that. They know who I am and what I'm talking about. They know their place, and they know my place. So it's okay to have fun, but they need to know that you're in control in the classroom. You don't, you're not abusive, but you speak firmly, calmly. You tell them what you expect, and then you hold them to that. They, they like that, kind of. Okay. They should anticipate a routine that is relaxed, predictable, and safe. Pierre mentioned earlier, and when you're telling the story, you have to be able to adjust a little bit to what's going on in the classroom. This is kind of that idea. So the, the atmosphere in the classroom is relaxed. You know, you don't say to the kids, all right, children, 901. We're doing this, and at 903, we're on this schedule. And if we don't get there, then it's hysterics in the barracks, and we're going to knock down, drag out, and get some things going. And these kids are like, ha, ha, ha. No, you're telling the story and, you know, one little dude, he's, he's got poison ivy that week. And I mean, he's scratching up a storm and the other kids, ah! you might have to move a little faster through the story, you know, and call for help. Get 911 down there. Somebody needs to get this kid to the calamine lotion or whatever. Relaxed, predictable and safe. This is important, too. They need to know what to expect. You can't have bathroom time at the beginning for three weeks, and then all of a sudden the kid's coming down, and he's got the wiggles, but he knows when I get down there, I can go to the restroom, because we always do. 
We're not doing that today, son. We're going with the 45 minute lecture, bathroom at the end. <sighs> you know, predictable. Get patterns. I would suggest that we develop patterns all across the board that can be expected by parents and children. Um, make it a place of fun and learning. They should expect a prepared education staff, which means you know the unit topic and the big picture. You study the Bible lesson, and by that I mean the Bible story, not just the written lesson material. You carefully plan each lesson. Select desirable outcomes. That would be that main focus. Also, some other things that you want to try and accomplish. Maybe there's this piece of information I think they need to know on this. Decide on an introduction. <clears throat> Excuse me, how are you going to open it? Prepare an outline or lesson plan. Decide on activities and assemble materials. This is a big one, in particular in the Old Testament. Be sure you know how to, cor you know, correct pronunciation of names of people and places. And then have all the materials laid out prior to the beginning of your lesson. Have it all out. And what should parents and children know? That a teacher will develop lessons based on the foundation children already possess. So if it's twos and threes, we're working with smaller children, less life experience. So their foundations aren't big, so you're not coming in with big words. You don't drop atonement, election, predestination, inspiration. I mean, you could do it, and then you can define it, but they won't remember next week. They don't have that foundation. So parents need to know that you're dealing with those kids right where they're at. And as we get older, we can add layers to that thing. And then that second bullet, a teacher will get to know each student and aim at gradually increasing the level of difficulty as their ability to perform increases. So little Jonathan was in here a minute ago. Is Jonathan two and a half, three? Two. He did? Just turned two? Well, it wasn't that long ago. Man, it seems like he's been alive for a long time. <laughs> Yeah. Man, it does. It seems like a long time ago I was at the hospital with him and you and Pierre. Anyway, okay, so Jonathan, okay, know your student, what's he able to do and not do. And if you're teaching him on a regular basis or you're tied in there and that's your class, what's something I can expect from him in three months? And at two and three, it might be our goal is for our new two year olds that they sit with their hands on the table at the end of the first month in class. We really want that, so that's an emphasis. You work at that. Now, that might not seem like earth-shattering theology, but at that age, they have to learn to work in community and work with their teacher. So that's something you talk about. Hey, Jonathan, you know what we're gonna do in class? We're gonna sit during story time with our hands on the table. And we're gonna do that, right, Billy? Susie, we're gonna do that, right? Yeah, and so when they get their hands off the table, where do we keep our hands? And then you go back to your story. Where do we keep our hands? You're just working at that. And then when they get that down, then you go to another thing. And the same thing is true with truth. You got to lay that stuff out and let it rip. Okay, now, um, then I've got that section, Implement Principles of Effective Communication into Your Teaching. I probably don't do some of this stuff. I probably need somebody to watch me, give me feedback. Speak clearly so that children understand what you're saying. You know, you don't have to just talk fast. I talk fast. Um, it's good to slow down. Vary your pitch and speed. This just goes with storytelling. I love to tell stories. I used to make stories up for my kids. If you were to ask, ask, ask one of my kids when they're here sometime about little Tommy Bod. Clifford might for might have forgotten, but Carissa will remember Tommy Bott and Courtney for sure. Um, anyway, and I'd get into it, you know, animated hands, eyebrows moving all the time, you know. Get into it. So vary your pitch. Be aware of your volume. Too loud intimidates children. Too soft causes them to lose interest. Um, and here's where we get into some stuff that's important. Be aware of possible distractions. Some come from within the learner and can't be controlled. Others come from the environment. Room temperature, like it's smoking hot in here. Um, room setup, having visual aids in order. 
Be aware of that stuff. Pardon me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you might have to cover them up with a sheet, that kind of thing. Have your lesson plan handy. How many of you prepare a lesson plan, a sheet that you're going to go through? Good. You need to so that you know where you're going. Plot it out. I mean, write the stuff in. If I'm going to share an illustration, write the illustration in there. I'm going to use a banana, but only three sides of the peel. I'm not going to use the other three or four. It doesn't matter. Okay, but write that stuff in. Always use scripture, a scripture reading. So if you're telling a Bible story, it's good to show them it's from the Bible. And for the older kids, I'd read it. Read it to them. And if they're old enough, have them read it. Share it. And then ask questions about the main idea, which we've talked about, and the details to ensure they understand. Ask them what the lesson teaches. Little James. Um, who taught James about the Noah's Ark? Are they here? James Hornby. Okay. Yeah. James is at my house last Thursday night. We had a meeting for Family Discipleship Night. He's there. So people started spitballing questions at him about the story that the Robinsons taught him. And he was getting answers out, you know, and he, he's quiet. So you had to really listen. But he got, he, I mean, this is four days later and the kid still remembers this stuff. So that's really good. It was reinforcing. Keep students focused. Try to stay on schedule. Don't wander off. Um, for feedback, find out what learners know, how they feel, what they're doing, ask questions, lots of questions. Um, here's an old Chinese uh, proverb, and here's how this relates. Get them involved in the learning process. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. So 10% of what we hear we remember. 50% of what we see or hear and see we remember. 90% of what we hear, see, and do we remember. Um, any questions or comments that you have? I don't know how helpful this stuff is. Um, it's just kind of me talking about things I know and things I've borrowed from people. I think probably the most helpful thing in terms of what I've talked about would be this lesson from Esther. Just shows you the process by which I put stuff together. Um, when you're teaching, I, I would recommend this too, because this gets to distractions. There are some children that can do multiple things and listen. Not a lot of them. Um, Joel was probably one of those kids because he doodles now. And that's, while, that's what he does while he's listening. He draws perfect circles. Um, but he does. Yes, or straight lines. We had a young lady at the previous church who wrote flowers, did flowers on her page. But she, that's, some people are that way. I had a little boy at the church at Berean that he, I finally learned that I tell him to sit down and everybody else is sitting on their chair. And in just seconds, he was like this. But he heard everything. He heard absolutely everything. But he was probably a kid that needed a little band on his chair. To move his feet. There's kids that have, I don't know what it's called, but they need to be moving. They're kinetic or kinesthetic learners. So they need to be moving or something. And you might have a child like that. But I would suggest when you're teaching, uh, unless you know a child has a specific need like that, that they're looking at you, that you have their attention. So, you know, they can't listen well and play with their matchbox or have their dolly on their head, or um, you know, be turned around looking the other direction. So I would refrain from the coloring pages while you're teaching, unless you're asking them to do something with the coloring page related to the lesson. We just talked about Ananias. Look at your coloring page. Which one is Ananias? And they point. Color his hair whatever color you want. Do it real fast. And they do it. Bobby, what color did you color Ananias' hair? Purple? Bobby, that's brown. You just did what Ananias did. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Pierre? 
Right. Um, so that little boy I was talking about, when I finally figured out, because I figured it out pretty quick, I'd ask questions and I'd think, ah, oh, there's no way. And <laughs> he knew all the answers. So then I realized I can't worry so much about that. So I would say, kind of stay around your chair. You know, be touching your chair with the, some body part. That, that's what we did. You know, and the other kids, I knew they could. He just couldn't. He wasn't being rebellious. He would just, that's how he listened. He was a kinesthetic learner, going, you know. So there's different kinds of learning styles, and we need to know our children, the children that we're teaching. And we can talk to parents about that, too. What do they expect? What do they do? If they have a little ball, you know, that they squeeze, yeah, they can bring the ball to class and squeeze it. Just don't hit others with it or something. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Which that's the Old Testament or the, the New, yeah, but it shows what this is all about. Yeah, so you can see. So in this particular one, number sixty-seven that you have, it's about Matthew one eighteen through twenty-five in the parallel passage, Luke two one through thirty-eight. They give you some themes that are found in the text. God keeps his promises. God communicates with man. Jesus coming glorifies God. Faith pleases God. God's salvation in Jesus is for all peoples. God's salvation in Jesus is the source of great joy. You have first and second graders. Are you going to teach them all of those themes on the morning? No. No, there's no way you can. So you can select one of those and run with it. You can take Matthew 1, 18 through 25 and go through this discipline that we talked about, and what about one of these themes in this text do I see? What's the problem? What's the solution? And unfold it that way. And then here's where the helps come that Sue was talking about. So here's some hooks. Show a suitcase or a duffel bag. And then you would show that to the kids. What is this? When do you use it? Would you like to hear a story from the Bible about two people who went on a trip? And some smart aleck will go, no. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Yes. Not it was just a funny question, kids. <laughs> Mr. Buttermore didn't mean it. <laughs> it was a hook. Um, and then you can see all of the look ideas here. This is where this stuff's helpful because this is the hardest stuff in terms to do. For me, it is. So I emphasize the time understanding the scripture, but then I have a lot less time for application development and all of these things. So that's helpful stuff. In terms of your sermon study, what's the hardest thing to get to? Application. application. Because you spend the bulk of your time studying the text and writing a sermon, and then you get, well, how do we gonna, what am I gonna ask? What am I gonna say? Where are I gonna take them in terms of applying this? So this is where this is really helpful. But there isn't a story scripted out for you to tell.